Some of you might remember a couple of years ago, my co-host Aaliyah did an interview with the then leader of the Alberta Party. The provincial board of the Alberta Party, being aware of the catastrophic damage that not having an acting leader would do to their party, named a flag bearer for the party to allow it to continue in its efforts to gain ground. And I am so stoked to be interviewing that person here today. So to start with, I just want to thank the acting leader of the Alberta Party for joining us today. For my first question, how damaging to the party's credibility and public confidence do you think it would have been if you had not been named in such a timely fashion? Well, we're very excited today because we're actually going to revisit that theme. And today we have joining us the current leader of the Alberta Party. Oh, not again. Nope, not again. Welcome to another episode of The Breakdown. We are less than a year and a half away from the next provincial election. And that provincial election promises to be even more, I'm going to go ahead and use the word dramatic, than the last provincial election, which was by all accounts a absolute dumpster fire and extremely polarizing for the province of Alberta. There's no question that the two main parties are working their way to dominating that conversation, but there are several other parties that are working to diversify the conversation a little bit and to make sure that there is an abundance of choice for Albertans going into that election. One of those parties is the Alberta Party. And the Alberta Party has gone through some fascinating evolutions since 2019, the most recent of which has them with a brand new leader who is not brand new to politics and brings quite a bit of experience to the game. And we are extremely grateful to be able to welcome Barry Morshita to the show. Barry, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Nate. I'm uh, excited about our conversation. Awesome. So to start with, before we get into the, the really fun stuff, what's your story? Like the One of the things that we like to do is to try to make sure that the, the people who are listening or watching our show know who we're talking to. So if you could sort of give us the life story of, of Barry in five minutes or less. Sure, sure. You know, it, and it, it, it's kind of an interesting story, actually. So uh I'm born and raised in Alberta, um, been lived here my whole life, except for a couple of summers where I spent in BC, but um, my, I'm a third generation Japanese Canadian. So my grandmother was born in British Columbia and uh, was interred, her family was interred in 1941 or 42, I can't remember exactly the year, but they were interred in Tashby, BC, just outside of Hope. So they went from the Okanagan actually towards the coast, but Hope was, you know, outside that 100 kilometer range. So they actually built an entire town there. Um, fascinating. I have yet to go out there and see uh, the museum and stuff, but obviously heard a bit about it. Grandparents didn't talk much about the experience, but kind of as I've, as I've gone through my iteration as a municipal leader, particularly in Brooks with all the immigration and the stories that come, I've kind of rediscovered uh, that piece of my history. So uh, my dad and my aunt were actually born in an internment camp in British Columbia, so 1945, which is kind of frightening when you think about kind of some of the language of discrimination we get and some of the those people comments, you know, my, my parent, my dad was born in an internment camp, which is pretty scary, um, just for being Japanese, um, and a second generation Canadian, which is pretty frightening. So, um, you know, I, uh, Grew up in, in and around the Brooks area on a farm uh, just outside, a place called Rosemary. I um, went to school there, graduated, I started university, and then I had an opportunity to buy a business that I had worked the summer for, and that's kind of began my time here. I spent 30 years owning that business. I got married, I had a couple of kids, uh, ended up um, going on to some committees here in the city, I uh, ran for council in 1998, uh, was on for six years, lost a mayoral election, 
and then stayed off for two terms and went back on to council in 2010. Uh, fascinating time to be in municipal politics. Um, the province, of course, was pulling back or kind of pulling back and there were ups and downs with the energy industry, which is a big part of our community. Uh, but our plant had been growing up, um, you know, 3,000 people at the processing plant here now, and uh, became mayor in 2016 in by-election. Our former mayor is now the member of parliament for um, our area. And uh, yeah, kind of got to uh, spend some time provincially with the AUMA and uh, got to be president for four years, which was a fascinating fascinating time. I really loved it a lot. Uh, great people and, and a lot of opportunities to learn about Alberta there. And then, you know, the election came around and as the as the municipal elections were starting, it, I knew I wasn't going to be at AUMA uh, any longer and I was looking to see what challenges were out there and what opportunities. And, you know, I, I was increasingly disenchanted with what was happening with the tone uh, provincially. And so, uh, spent about eight or nine months discerning whether I should be doing this and here I am. So that's kind of a pretty small, short little history. That, but it's, it's, a, it's a, a fascinating one, quite frankly, and I think it's a very important one. Um, the, the internment piece in particular is such a dark piece of Canadian history, of which there are more than I think most people are willing to acknowledge. Um, but uh, certainly with the increasing tone and rhetoric, I mean, we just did an episode where we talked about the, the racist undertones that exist underneath a lot of the, the freedom rallies, and in particular, a lot of the key members of the, the freedom rallies. Uh, and so it's, I'm, a, I'm a big believer if, the, if we don't choose to learn from our history, we're bound to repeat it. Um, yeah. So I think that that's a, I could probably spend an hour talking about just that um, but let's talk a little bit more about the alberta party and i have to it would be irresponsible of me to not do the the full disclosure bit i'm sure you're aware but for any members of her our audience who aren't listening uh i was uh, a member of the alberta party i did run for the alberta party in 2019 uh the team here at the breakdown made some jokes i'm not a member of the alberta party anymore <laughs> Um, which is, for me, I think the best place to be. But the Alberta Party has gone through some, let's go with remarkable growing pains over the last few years. Greg Clark was the leader. Uh, he stepped down, triggering a leadership race. That leadership race saw the election of Stephen Mandel to be leader of the Alberta Party, which took them into the 2019 election. There's a lot of people who have mixed opinions about how that campaign went. Um, and for a, a good chunk of time was without uh, a, a leader. Uh, Jackie Fenske became the acting leader, and, and here you are. But this has created, I think, a lot of, I'm going to go with questions, about what is the Alberta Party now? So that's going to be my, my first question to you. If, if you were to, I'm going to say, reintroduce or introduce the Alberta Party to Albertans, what is the Alberta Party now? Well, I, I think the Alberta Party is is a principle based party. They 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 focus on decisions and policy and processes, really centered around these six principles and without the ideology attached. So, you know, as we watch what's happening in the provincial scene now, and the federal scene, and practically every other political scene right now, it seems that. You're either with us or, or against us and that you can never meet together, move together, get things done together. And the Alberta Party really does believe that just like what happens at the municipal table, that you can take a variety of perspectives um, with a focus on an outcome. And that's really important because you have to be able to know what you're trying to accomplish and pull the best of those ideas and take steps forward. You know, the one thing that really is attractive for me about the Alberta Party is the fact that people come from that place, that they are, they're problem solvers. They want to do that in a collaborative, constructive way. They're not interested in calling people names or saying, you don't know what you're talking about, or you're wrong, you're absolutely wrong, you're not right, we're not going to listen to you. That is the exact opposite of what we stand for. And, you know, it's hard to position yourself 
in terms of the spectrum. But I would say that the Alberta Party governs would govern from the middle and use the practical advice of really smart people as well as people's will through their elected officials to come up with, with uh, uh, policy and regulations and rules that move us forward or removing rules and regulations that move us forward. Um, you know, when it comes to finances, I think, I think the party is uh, fiscally responsible. I believe that we believe in paying for what you get. And that hasn't happened in Alberta since 1981 or so. We haven't really paid for what we spend. Uh, you know, I think we believe that generally uh, people need to be lifted up as a group. You know, if everyone is doing better, then the province is doing better. Uh, I think we believe that communities are where everything happens and that, a, and that some decentralization of processes and applications and services is not a bad thing. That the same model, the same uh, approach in Brooks might not work in Grand Prairie or Claire's home or Fort McMurray uh, or in downtown Calgary. I think we have to, I think we believe in those things. We trust people. Uh, I don't think we're the type of group I certainly am not the type of leader that says you shall do this. There will come a time through that process where we all have to pull on the same rope, but getting a, getting to that point is what's really important. I think that's the key to the Alberta party. And it's not as sexy as I will build you a pipeline or I will spend $10 billion on healthcare, but it's the right thing to do. And, and I have to believe that uh, Albertans uh, want to do the right thing, and they want to have a responsible group in government. Okay, um, I want to explore the the no ideology thing that you you started that with a little bit because I think that's one of the areas that people find really confusing. Um, you talked quite a bit about outcomes and and the importance of outcomes, but. I guess the question that I have is how do you determine what the outcomes are? How do you, how do you figure out what the, the goal is without having some sort of ideological approach that's going to determine what that goal is? So that's a great, uh, great question, Nate. And I think, I think we have to be careful about, you know, that the whole conversation about outcome in terms of ideology. So you know, uh, I'll give you a really good example of how um, a non-ideological approach makes things better. So when, when we had our, our pandemic uh, hit Brooks really hard, when COVID-19 hit Brooks really hard, we were the highest concentration of, of cases. I don't know if we are in respect to the fifth wave, but certainly to this point, you know, what, 4,400 cases per 100,000 people. And outcome didn't matter on the, we wanted to keep people safe and we wanted to make sure that was the ultimate outcome is to keep people safe and, and to keep the people in Brooks so that they, they didn't become destitute by not being able to work or, and those kinds of things. There were a lot of issues around supports at that time. You know, it was very iffy. There were no vaccines in the horizon, all of those things. So the outcome that we determined was to keep people safe and to keep the community whole. Now, those aren't ideologically driven. I would question that if there was a party or an ideology that said, I want to elevate one group or the other, I'm only going to look after one group. That's where our problem even begins. And I think to your point about asking that is that should you focus all your attentions here or there because your ideology says you should? Uh, no, we don't. And that's where I think the approach is better. Now, the processes in between were significantly different. We attacked the problem head on. We did it with good information. We pressed AHS to give us uh, information that they weren't giving us all of those kinds of things that we got, um, that we worked. We worked together with private enterprise to make things better for employees. We got together with social groups, immigration groups, you know, the, the broadest spectrum of, of perspective and people you could imagine. That's why we were successful. So I don't think ideology should be the out talk about be part of the outcome conversation. Um, I, and, I, and I think it limits the possibilities. So that's why I, you know, it's, it's hard to explain sometimes. And I, I agree with you that it becomes a bit of an issue for the Alberta party because while well, you're not over here, or you're not over there, where are you? Well, I'm right in your living room. I'm the things you, we are the party that talks about things the way you talk about them. Um, we discuss education from a perspective of being a parent or a teacher. Uh, we talk about finances from being a breadwinner or 
or having to deal with extra costs or dealing with inflation or the bank payments, um, payroll. That's, that's how we talk about it. And, and I don't think that's ideological. I think that's practical. And I think it's the conversation more Albertans want to actually be a part of. So one of the, the things that the Alberta party has historically identified itself with, uh, and it's, 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 fascinating to watch because of all of the political terminology that gets thrown around this word despite its inherent nature could very well be one of the most polarizing um is the alberta party still a centrist party i i you know i think i think we govern from there i i but i don't think the pathway is is down the center you know uh, i really believe that to get to that outcome, sometimes you're going to weave fiscally to the more conservative side. Sometimes you might, when it comes to social enterprise, uh, you might on, even on the finances, you might say, hey, look, you know, this is not a break even proposition today. It's actually an investment in people for tomorrow. So you might, you know, weave to the left on, on, on that type of investment. At the end of the day though, you're measured by the outcome, what you actually provided for people. And if you, if, you know, government fails when it doesn't deliver on that promise, people shouldn't be left behind, uh, no matter where you are on the earnings scale, no matter where you are, whether you're perfectly healthy or whether you have health issues, whether you're disabled or we're fortunate enough to not have to deal with those extra challenges. Government has, I believe, a, the moral imperative, and I believe they have the support of a majority of people to, to be there and to provide those outcomes. We fail when we don't. And I think we've seen that happen a lot over the last 10 years in Alberta. Okay. Um, I want to run through some, some topics, if that's okay with you, to, to get sort of... And I, I, I have to be honest with you, I have not looked at whether or not there's... there's let me phrase that a different way. I haven't heard if there's been a policy convention for the Alberta Party recently. So... Um, if, if you can speak to these to the best of your abilities from your from your own personal standpoint, and as well, if the Alberta Party has an official position on them, um, that would be that would be great. Um. Yeah, no, you know, we're working on having a policy uh, uh, conference and a policy uh, procedure kind of going forward for in 2022. So some of that's working on, but certainly I can I'll answer them as well as I can today for sure. Perfect. Um, so to start with, I just want to sort of frame all of this. One of the big conversations that we keep having with people over and over again is the, for a lot of people, they're looking at a lot of the decisions that the, uh, the current government has made. And one of the questions that they're asking is, you know, Jason Kenney made it very, very clear before he was elected that if he was elected, one of his goals was going to be doing a lot of stuff very, very quickly. Uh, and whether or not people agree with with the, the laws and the changes that Mr. Kenny has made, he has moved very, very quickly. Um, so yeah, let's just let's just run through a few of these and 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 and, and go th go from there. So supervised consumption sites, uh, highly controversial issue. Uh, for a lot of people, but the evidence seems to be overwhelming that some of the decisions, particularly the decision to make uh, providing ID mandatory in order to access supervised consumption sites, um, is 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 bad. Um, what is what would the Alberta Party do with supervised consumption sites? Well, I think they're part of the solution. I don't think they're all of it, but they're certainly part of it. I I agree with you. The science overwhelmingly supports the fact that supervised consumption sites save lives. And again, when you, you talk about outcome, when it comes to, to, to our population, we wanna keep them safe. Uh, when we have people with issues with addiction, um, we have to want to apply that same outcome to them. And I believe that supervised consumption sites are part of the solution. They aren't the whole solution. And I think that in part is where some of it's failed. I, I, uh, I, I listened a lot to Mayor Spearman in, in Lethbridge struggle with the issues that were going on in theirs. And one of the biggest problems was that there weren't any more wraparound services. The, you know, they were actually keeping people safe. The, the, the evidence is overwhelming that that was happening. 
And were there uh, other issues that came as a result of where it was and, and, and the, uh, where the clients had opportunities or not opportunities? I think that was part of it. There weren't, there weren't shelter opportunities in Lethbridge. There were not enough programming opportunities. Uh, they didn't integrate um, you know, other communities into the process. And, and I think uh, that's why I think it's, it's part of the solution. And we cannot throw away again for ideological reasons that we don't think we should be supplying uh, people with uh, a, a place to take illegal drugs or to even consider the, pop, the other option, which is to provide them with safe drugs. Those things should be form part of our solution. And people should step back and again say, are we trying to keep people alive or are we not caring whether they do live? And the Alberta party does, I do. We want to keep those people alive and that's part of the solution, I believe. Okay. Now you, you I, I don't know if you're reading my piece of paper here, um, but you, you kind of teed up my next one. So one of the things that we've seen during the pandemic response, particularly during periods of increased restrictions, I'm not going to call it a lockdown because I don't think we've ever actually seen a real lockdown in Alberta. Um, but one of the things that we've seen during the height of the restrictions was the fact that liquor stores were kept open. And the rationale behind that was if we didn't keep liquor stores open, you're going to have a boatload of alcoholics who are experiencing life-threatening or, or fatal uh, withdrawal symptoms. Um, that, to many people, made a very strong argument for safe supply. And you kind of alluded to it right there. Where does the Alberta Party stand on safe supply right now? Well, the party hasn't had the conversation, but I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about my view on that one. I believe that the government, again, does have a role to play there. I, I think, again, outcome, if the outcome is bad drugs, like drugs that are dangerous and killing people, and we haven't got the infrastructure in place to help them off or to move them away from their addiction or to treat or however you want to frame that. I know, I know there's a, a wide multitude of opportunities there and, and opinions, but I think that's something the government should be considering. I, you know, we would, we would do the same. We don't let people, uh, create alcohol and just sell it off the street. Um, we have a regulatory environment for alcohol because of that. And, and I, again, let's keep our outcomes in mind. Let's keep people from dying. And certainly that has to be part of the conversation in my mind. The party, I'm sure, will go through that and see how they feel. But uh, I would be advocating for that part of it for sure. Okay. Uh, provincial police force? Oh, you know, Nate, don't get me, you know what, this is such a dumb conversation and I will call it what it is. It is dumb. You know, again, this is one of the problems we have in politics today and it's gotten worse over the last 10 years is we have, we have a problem. A politician stands up at a podium and says, well, I'm going to fix it. Uh, even though they have no idea what they're doing. And literally they don't in this, on this issue in my mind, they have no idea what they're doing. And instead of going out and talking to the people that one, provide the service, two, that are affected by the level of service, they make an arbitrary political statement and then go down a road. 85% of people in Alberta don't want a provincial police service. They think the RCMP can do the job, providing that we give them the tools and the opportunities to do them. Local communities, um, have different needs. And I will, this is one of, you know, my cornerstone theories about how to make this province better. Local communities know what's going on. They know the people involved. They know what's, they know what has to be done. Do the RCMP need to get better at what they do? Absolutely. And I would tell, I will tell you without uh, a measure of doubt that in the last four years, they have gotten better. The RCMP are a more community-minded police force. They they are understanding that in order to be uh, legitimate and to be part of it, they have to integrate themselves into the community. They have to know that stuff. That's not going to change with the provincial police force. A provincial police force is only going to cost us more money. It's going to take forever to man up. Surrey is a good example. And, and you can see by the disaster in the Surrey changeover that you cannot roll it back like tomorrow and say, oh, we're not going to do that now. It'll cost us millions. And it is driven by a view that, that our, the RCMP, they can sell this narrative because it was in the fair deal 
that the RCMP are somehow controlled by Ottawa, running in Alberta, and that somehow they're, you know, they're keeping us down. Well, nothing could be further from the tape than the truth. You need to go talk to an officer, to a staff sergeant, to a superintendent to see what they're doing in Alberta, and you will see. People see it. Uh, the politicians don't. And of course, our justice minister, who's not really our justice minister right now, seems to be beating that drum to death. And uh, I can only see it because he is so committed to fighting with Ottawa about control of things uh, that he doesn't see the forest for the trees. We get great value for money with the RCMP. Our municipalities do. We have work to do, but we don't have to spend the time and effort on this. We got lots of bigger problems than that. Okay. Uh, speaking of some of the, the literal bigger problems, um, the, the question of, well, we don't really need those mountains. A uh, mine would look much better there. Um, do, you, do you, does the Alberta Party support the drastic changes to mining the, the Rockies that are, are certainly being proposed, if not pushed, by the current government? We, we don't, and, and in light of all the other opportunities, economic in Alberta, which there are plenty, why would we sacrifice one resource to extract another one? Uh, water perhaps will, certainly is one of the most important things we need. I mean, besides breathing, water's right there. We, we can't live without both of those things, good air and good water. And uh, why would we sacrifice water for the extraction of another resource when there are so many other economic opportunities in Alberta to take advantage of. I, again, uh, it, it comes down to that outcome. What is best for Alberta? What is best for Albertans? And uh, I don't think, um, you know, risking their water supply is a good thing. Doesn't, doesn't make sense. There, there might come a day, Nate, when, you know, technology, I don't know, because I, I won't say never for anything, there's a lot of things we do now that we didn't do 50 years ago thinking we'd never do them. Um, and I don't dis, dis, uh, you know, discount that op possibility. But right now, I, I don't see, given what we know and certainly what's been uh, published, that it makes sense to, to sacrifice that water supply, particularly in southern Alberta, where we have such a disparity uh, with water and population. It, it just doesn't make sense. We have seen an increasing push from the provincial government, the current provincial government. Uh, they have privatized a great deal of healthcare affiliated jobs. Uh, we saw them terminate over 10,000 jobs um, and move them to the private sector with the hopes of rehiring those folks. Uh, we have seen a, an increasing level of conversation in regards to the privatization of other areas of healthcare. Healthcare privatization, go. So I, I guess on the whole idea of efficiency and, and effectiveness, I think we have to, I have to, we have to be open-minded. I don't think privatization of, of healthcare is, is the goal at all. Certainly not my goal. We, our public system is better than anything we have in the, anywhere in the world, and we should guard that very fiercely. There is, though, I think, opportunities for us to get better at delivering healthcare. And um, I, I think we have to be open-minded about the possibilities. I don't know that the numbers supported a private, you know, the, the lab changes. I don't know that the numbers supported the laundry changes because at the end of the day, that's what you're trying to make sure you're actually getting value for money and you're doing it in a good transparent way. Uh, I, I still believe though, that there are lots of opportunities for better efficiencies in all our spending, not just healthcare, but um, certainly, uh, looking at them with an open mind has to be a possibility. Should it be the first thing we consider? I don't think so, because the public, the public delivery of our system makes it so good. So I don't think that would be the first thing the Alberta Party, certainly not the first thing I would look to. I believe there's a lot of opportunities in healthcare to make, uh, make for better outcomes, but I don't think that's the number one priority for sure. With the, the healthcare piece, there's been quite a bit of conversation in the, the media um, and certainly we have seen recently MLAs from both sides of the aisle calling for the government to address the current situation for EMS in the province of Alberta. What's your stance on, on I mean, would you do anything? What would you do? I guess is the, the question. Well, you, you know, a good, again, you know, let's just, another example that's recently happened with regards to that, decision-making. 
you know, the EMS dispatch piece. So, you know, working fine, we're going to spend money to change it. We say it's going to get better, but it was working fine and people were getting the job done. But yet out of a sense of having to centralize, out of a sense of having everything be the same, we pull it back in. And now we know it's not just anecdotal. We have evidence that supports longer dispatch times in, in Lethbridge and Fort McMurray and problems in Calgary. I was actually, I'd made a 911 call where I was moved three times through a connection service because of, uh, with an emergency situation now. We did get service and things worked out fine, but, but I, I, heard, I heard the issue going through right after the uh, change in that goes. So when it comes to EMS, I think we have to look back at what was successful and why it's gotten worse. And I think it's gotten worse over a longer period of time than just the last couple of years. I think it's just got to the breaking point now. But again, I, I, I'm not sure, Nate. I mean, I, I know you're in the field and you gotta be careful what you say, like we all have to be sometimes, but I think there must be solutions in there. People must see what's going wrong. I just read an article from a, from a paramedic, I believe in Airdrie, uh, was written in October where, you know, some of these times have doubled, you know, where 12 to 14 was the norm and in and around the city of Calgary, it's now like 32, 26 to 32 or 40 minutes and crazy stuff like that. So it didn't happen overnight. So I think we have to examine that. And I, I don't know exactly what the solution is, but it needs to be dealt with quickly. I, I don't believe it's just resources. I believe resources are part of it, but I also think it's the way the system is run. Um, you know, you, you hear stories and, and people who want to say things but can't. And again, that should never be the case in Alberta. I don't care what field of work you're in, you should never be afraid of saying, hey, the system needs to be fixed. Uh, and you don't say anything because you're worried about your job. That's, that's not how we, we make good decisions by knowing good information. And, and I don't think those things are lacking. So that would be first, we need to find out what's wrong and we need to find it out from the people that are driving trucks and looking after patients and trying to get, uh, trying to make them safe. It's, there's something wrong. One of the big contentious issues, and it was largely, as we've, we've found over the last couple of years, uh, manufactured and based on incredibly flawed information, is the question of uh, GSAs and protections for kids in schools. Uh, the UCP did make changes to the GSA rules that the NDP introduced uh, and made it so that it's arguably more challenging, I'm going to try to say this as diplomatically as I can, arguably more challenging to for kids to set up GSAs because there's no longer a time mandate uh, and there are a lot of questions about notifications for parents. Would you leave things as they are? Would you like to go back and address some things? How would you, how would you like to handle that going forward? Again, I, I, I think the, the rules that were established under the NDP seem to make more sense to me at the time. Now, again, not having directly experienced that, I think we have to ask those kids in particular, the ones that are affected by this type of regulation, how, uh, how will they be best served by what's going on? Um, and I don't believe that the, the rules, again, uh, are, are serving someone uh, and, and, you know, maybe well-meaning parents. I don't know if that's, you know, if people want to get involved in that. But the fact is, is that the reason for GSAs, and again, this is a pretty simple dynamic that I operate. We do it because we want a better outcome for those kids. So how do, what are the rules and how do they make it so that the kids actually get that outcome? And I don't believe the changes introduced uh, support that. I don't think they make it better. And we should only be changing things when they make it better. So I think we got to go back at least to the rules that were established before. But probably more importantly, we should be talking to those kids directly and saying, OK, what how should they be structured? How should they be set up so that you get the support you need? Okay. Don't be afraid of it. That, that's a good conversation to have. One of the other big topics that I want to get your, your take on, and then I have a, a few more things that I want to play with, um, is there seems to have been, and certainly we've seen this from multiple sectors, healthcare and education are two of the biggest ones, a f significant damage in the trust that exists between the people who work in those sectors and the government. We've, we've certainly seen the, the UCP under Mr. Chandro effectively wage literal and figurative war on doctors uh, across the province and in, in a driveway near some people. Um, how would the 
Does the Alberta party have a plan on how they're going to address that damaged trust? And what is, if, if they do, what does it look like? Well, again, it, it talks about inclusion and collaboration. Uh, we're, we've, we've talked about, I've thought about and, and had mentioned that, you know, who governs Alberta Health Services? You know, um, why don't doctors, nurses, paramedics, emergency people, why, why don't they have a seat at that table? Everything that gets decided around that board table or so we're led to believe that it's instituted by the, the, the president and the management of that affects those groups. Why don't they have a voice at the table? So I think you look at that first. I think the governance of Alberta Health Services and Alberta Health, and you say, who's missing from the table? The doctors should be there. The nurses should be there. Nurse practitioners, um, your, your field, paramedics and EMS, that, that should be part of the conversation because we all have something to offer to make our system better. You know, in my experience at the city of Brooks, a, a parallel just, and I know it's a lot smaller scale, but when we were facing a lot of budget uncertainty and a lot of budget pressure, it was easy to go, hey, why don't you go and cut 30% or 20% and come back with those in council and decide. And what we did was uh, we changed it. We said, that everybody has to decide this. We have to decide the priorities of the corporation together. So sometimes maybe public works got a lot more money than recreation did or vice versa, but we dealt with it on a priority basis and all of the smart people that were running those areas were part of it. So we shouldn't be, first of all, discounting their opinions by saying, you know, tearing up contracts and discounting their uh, opinions or expertise by saying we know better. And again, imposing a solution on people. They have great solutions. When I met with my doctors, here's an example. You know, they told me that they were willing to take a 5% cut in remuneration. All they wanted was the ability to administer that money so that they could provide the best possible outcomes for their patients. Now, who can't buy that conversation? I certainly think it makes sense. But yet, we are so concerned with who has control that we discount those views. And so I guess in healthcare, one of the things I do immediately is try to Make sure the people that have a vested interest are at the table because I do trust professionals to deliver on their promise. They, they, they've, they've got an oath and a code of conduct that they've committed to. We have to be able to trust people with those things. And so uh, that's what we would do. Way more open conversation and make them part of the process. Okay. Uh, I know that we have some, some fans of priority-based budgeting who listen to the show that you've probably just made very, very happy. Uh, <laughs> um, the what the last issue that I the sort of broad issue that I want to sort of get your your take on is the question of the relationship between the provincial and this is complicated as all hell. I want to preface that, um, but the relationship between the provincial government and First Nations people. We have seen a almost willful ignorance from the current provincial government in regards to the the history of First Nations in Canada, um, First Nations before Canada, uh, the fact that we do have large tracts of Canada that are, are still not owned by Canada, in effect, um, and reality. How does the Alberta Party, what is the Alberta Party's path to addressing, starting to address, because it's going to be a long-term thing, obviously, but starting to address the long-standing issues and distrust that exist between First Nations, Indigenous peoples, and everybody who's not? Well, I, I think our approach has to be significantly different. And, uh... I think it starts, first of all, of educating yourself um, and understanding the history, the real history of First Nations and the issues that have evolved from colonization and imposition of, of culture on people that uh, weren't prepared or weren't working with us to get that done. So there's all kinds of education. We have to understand, first of all. And then we have to, I think, break away from the idea that appeasement is reconciliation. You know, you can't... Uh, no different than my grandmother, when she was interred, and I know this is quite a different dynamic, but it, it's kind of similar. When my grandmother was interred, she lost everything. She, she, they got to walk out of their owned property 
with uh, 50 pounds of stuff, lost their gun, their truck, their, their, their orchard, everything was taken away from them. And then 40 years later, the government of Canada gave people that were interred a check, I believe, for $20,000. And that wasn't done in my mind at the time. I, you know, I misunderstood it at the time. I thought, oh, wow, all well, these people get 20 grand. That's awesome. But it was appeasement. It wasn't reconciliation. I was young and didn't understand that. But I see it now. And I've, I've talked to some First Nation leaders who want the conversation to change. And I think this is how it has to change. I think when it comes to development, when it comes to being part of the curriculum, which, again, we saw just a terrible, terrible uh, treatment of First Nations and Métis people in Alberta through the curriculum, in my mind. When it comes to resource development, development on reserves and settlements here, let's switch the conversation to what do, what do you need to happen? What needs to happen for your people, for the people of this nation, these First Nations, to thrive and be successful? Don't impose again. We already put a layer down when we talk about resource development and, and again, this is not, the party hasn't gone through this, but in my discovery, this is what I think we need to do. We need to switch it up and say, okay, let's, the first layer is, is the Aboriginal, uh, Indigenous layer, excuse me. Maybe the, the resource development, whether it's trees here or oil and gas here or hunting or whatever it happens to be, I don't know. Mining could be a, a million things. Um, the first layer is an indigenous layer, and then maybe we work around that. Maybe industry determines whether they can work around that, rather than the always flip side, which is you adjust to us. Here's the deal. Can you make it work? What do we have to pay you to make the deal work? That's not what they're looking for, at least the people I've talked to. They want their views considered first, and then we move on from there. It's not a lot to ask, I don't think. I think, uh, and I think, you know what? I think industry would welcome it because there would be certainty for them. We have things now called a consultation that take years and years and years because no one really knows uh, what we're trying to accomplish there, except again, in my mind, an appeasement so we can move the, move the shovel or move the drilling rig. And that shouldn't be what we're trying to do. Um, municipalities have been doing it for years. When we start with a blank piece of quarter section and planning, uh, the first thing we look around and we, we determine what's around there, what we shouldn't do or what isn't really smart to do. Why can't we do the same things with First Nations? I, seems to me a, a really good step. It would allow them to have control over that piece, to, to be part of the process at the beginning. Um, they have a really neat thing about... Um, I think it's seven, gen seven generation rule. I don't know exactly what it's called, Nate, but when they make a decision, it's, it's supposed to be considered what's going to do going seven generations forward. And uh, I don't think that's a bad planning exercise when we're talking about these things that are gonna be there very long term. So I think we have to have them at the table in a meaningful way. And that means, again, ceding some of the control and trusting them to do what's best for everyone because Again, what's good for them, I think, is good for the province of Alberta. They're growing population. They provide economic opportunities for uh, their bands and, and others around. I mean, it just seems to me that we can all benefit from a better relationship. Okay. Uh, last one. Um, and, and, and then I want to try to have a little bit of fun. Uh, the curriculum. What, what would you do with that little piece of... Thing. Throw it out. Okay. Throw it out. <laughs> I, yeah, it is easy. And it's actually kind of <laughs> tell you a little bit of a story. One of the reasons I'm running is because of my grandchildren. My grand, my my daughter and my son-in-law, full disclosure, both teachers. They told me about the curriculum when it first came out, how terrible it was. And you know, me being a dad, I'm saying, well, let's have a look at it. You know, you guys. Or, or have a bias already, you don't want to do this, blah, 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 good enough. So I read the grade one curriculum because that's the first one my granddaughter is going to be. Well, I can tell you who would want to go to school after I read it, listen to the music they're suggesting after I read it, who would want to go to grade two? That's not what the, not what the curriculum should be. And I've talked to a few people since, uh, people that know a heck of a lot more about curriculum development and teaching than I do. And again, we, we need to step back from our ideological perspectives, get rid of those and say, again, 
the outcome is to provide, my understanding, they've all said it, is to provide Alberta students to be the best in the world, to be the best thinkers, to be the best, to, to, to be the smartest and the most well-prepared to, to move on and do great things in this province and this country and the world. Okay, great. You know what? We were ranked in the top third across the world anyway to start with. So our curriculum couldn't have been that bad. Can we wait 10 years to, you know, to change it all the time? I don't think we live in that world anymore. I think we have to be continually improving it. But I believe, again, involving the people that are most, uh, you know, affected by it, teachers, students, parents, in saying, how do we get prepared for the future? How do we make the curriculum more relevant as we move forward? Because we're moving at so much a faster pace. I think would have been a far better way. I know lots of people that I've talked to would have been more than happy to do incremental changes as we go. Um, because the burden of change is very difficult. Their setting is very dynamic. There's all kinds of reasons for not doing this. So absolutely, it should be gone. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, in, in a year, it's not too well entrenched and it's not as disruptive, but I think ultimately you can't have that kind of curriculum if you want a, a world-class education system in Alberta. What would, uh, let's say that, that the Alberta party sweeps the next election. Uh, so you're, you're the premier. Yeah. <laughs> um, and all of a sudden we get a, an unexpected health crisis. What would you do differently than what the current premier has done? Well, uh, again, I can, two things. I can point to experience and, and, you know, going back, seeing what you did wrong always and, and making sure you have a good plan, which we did. I think Alberta had a good emergency management plan. We just didn't follow it very well. Um, but I can only point to my own experience in Brooks. So I, I, I referenced it earlier, but, but I can tell you that, again, you have to trust people to make good decisions. But they will not make, they cannot make good decisions when they don't have all the information. So what we did in Brooks was we, we understood what was happening at the plant. We understood what was happening in the community. We, we worked really hard to, to get information from AHS. And then we sent that out to the community. The, one of the most important decisions we made at the very beginning was no matter what kind of information is, whether it points to, you know, uh, trouble on the horizon or whether it's good news it has to go out and people have to be able to discern it and make good decisions with that information which we did which i am so proud of my community that we did that um we 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 uh, attacked the problem where it was coming out again to keep people safe it, it doesn't make sense in my mind to apply again the same rules during an emergency when the same conditions don't exist i and this is a practical, I was in a much smaller scale than the, than the premier. And I understand some of those decisions must have been very difficult. But again, uh, in, in my experience, you, you deal with it where the problem is. When we have a fire or a flood, we don't send crews everywhere across the province. We, we attack the point of problem where the fire is. I think we should have done that with the pandemic. I think in my case, where we knew a community spread was happening among a certain community, we brought resources to that community, we, we brought language resources, we brought uh, basic necessity resources, we had volunteers, we had mass testing, we did all of those things that could direct be directed towards uh, a group that was, you know, a victim of the infection. And as a result, you know, over a very reasonable period of time, we took our infection rate from its highest to zero. And I think it, it was information and being very directed. And uh, politics have to disappear. These are people's lives at stake, and we cannot be considering them under a political lens. I, again, trust Albertans to make good decisions with good information. That doesn't okay. mean we'll all agree, but I think that happens in a majority of the cases. With the, the pandemic response, one of the really contentious issues has been the role of the CMOH. Uh, there have been multiple legal scholars who have made it abundantly clear that she does have the power to affect changes, but she's also been abundantly clear that she believes that her role is advisory only. I'm curious, would you, would you, it sounds so strange to say it this way, but I'm going to, 
if you were premier, would you allow the CMOH to do her job? Yeah, I, I, you have to. I, I think that's part of the dynamic. Now, where the buck stops still, I think, in Alberta, as with everywhere, is, is with the, the head of the elected government. So uh, I think to not be part of the process is important. But yes, you have to allow her to do her job. And I, again, focusing on the outcomes of the situation versus the political outcomes or statements that you make or how you look or, or whatever. You gotta set that aside for a while because there is no future unless you get through it. And so that has to be your first concern. And certainly, uh, I, and I don't understand all of the legislative roles or, or pieces in that, but certainly, uh, again, if you, um, if you had competing views about what to take, you know, um, which, is, which we've had, we've got experts that you know, have a range of, of views on certain issues, how to proceed and not, those should be out on the table. If the chief medical officer of health is suggesting we do A, but the group that's determining it, however that works out, I'm not sure exactly, but says group B, let's see that on the table. Let's, let's, it should make sense to us. If it made sense to you, it should make sense to us. So I think having that full disclosure is a really important piece of it. That would allow somebody like this CMOH to do their job as a department, as her, her job is as the chief medical officer, to do her job knowing that you uh, have all that information and that you're on side. And I, I think that was the, if there was one piece clearly that I think we should have improved on and, and still you can't tell whether the outcomes would be better or worse, but Albertan should have known everything about COVID-19 from the minute it, it hit, hit the border, so to speak. We should have known everything about it. If you wanted to read all the scientific knowledge and all the things that, that, that Dr. Hinshaw was considering, you should have been able to get. And it's unfortunate that that doesn't seem to be how we're operating. That's plain wrong in them. How would you like to address, one of the things that we've seen over the last couple of years is what some people are referring to as the Americanization of the discourse, the political discourse here in Alberta, where we're seeing more and more rather than a rational, reasonable discussion from elected officials and, and people in power, what we're seeing is attack, 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 and denigrate your, your opponent as much as possible, regardless of, of what their idea is. Mr. Kenny campaigned on restoring decorum to the legislature and shortly after was handing out earplugs in the legislature. How would you, uh, how do you plan to address this within the Alberta party going forward into the next election? And should the Alberta party get people elected or get enough people elected to form government? Is, how is that, how are you gonna manage that piece? First of all, I don't do personal attacks. I will uh, certainly point out a policy problem or something that someone has done wrong, but I am in no position to judge anyone. And but we've we've let our politics do that. We've we've called people names. We've we've said they're anti-Albertan or anti-this or that. that. Those are terrible things to say about anybody. Anybody that steps up to be elected, uh, whether you're running municipally, provincially, or federally isn't doing it to tear things apart. They actually are, I think, at their core motivation is to build things up. So to judge them on that is, is ridiculous. And that has to stop. The other thing is, is that Alberta, uh, and I think politics has to elevate itself, but we, we are elevated by people how they vote and we're moved by people that vote. You know, elections are a contest. And so the minds around tables of strategy to win the contest sometimes I believe, give way, you know, if we only do this, we make people afraid of her or make people afraid of him, uh, you know, we'll get elected. Um, I think Albertans have to generally look at that and say, you know what, it's, it's time for us to, to view people and leadership, and what we want, what we actually need to vote for, that we need pragmatic, practical people to, to run our province, that um, it, we just have to do it. And you know, I, I'm, I'm willing to, to live uh, and die, so to speak, on that foundation. Um, I had a really good friend of mine, a good colleague of mine say, Barry, you know, uh, you, you look at, we're looking at exactly kind of how you described it, you know, the people 
calling names and, and saying they're this and saying they're that with these glib remarks and kind of theatrical stunts to make people giggle or laugh or to make them afraid of something or to characterize them in a certain way. And he said, you know, do what you need to do, but you know, you have to be prepared to lose for something. And uh, I am prepared to lose to make sure that this idea that uh, we need to conduct ourselves properly, that we need to advance politics so that it becomes people, something people want to be part of, and that it, it ultimately will lead to a better Alberta. I, I'm willing to just, I'm, I'm rooted in that. I will not give that up. And I will quite frankly not allow um, members that uh, are running uh, to give that up either. So, you know, you don't see us attacking people personally. Uh, you won't see MLAs calling names. You won't see candidates calling names. We're going to point out the failings of parties and uh, individual candidates in terms of actions and legislation, but you will not see us uh, personally attacking anyone. Yeah, you're gonna see us offer up something for people to vote for, which is I think the most important thing and it's the best way to con uh, you know, keep our democracy strong. Is there anything else? I mean, that, that works. I, we, we got through my list, plus a few that I added as we went. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like people to hear? Is there anything else you'd like people to know about the, the you or the Alberta party or the, the, the plans going forward? You know, I, I, I think when we, when we talk about government generally, we should look at groups that in Alberta, I think the, the, things, that are, the things that are important are, are, are people, number one, our planet number two, and prosperity number three. And those are not mutually exclusive. Those are things that you put together and you prioritize your engagement, you prioritize your investments in order to make those things move forward. And the Alberta party will do that. I will do that. That's the only way I've made decisions. I have not run a deficit in 16 years. I've had to make hard decisions about services and taxes. I've had to make hard de decisions about delaying uh, projects and, and be part of a group that worked through that. And as a result, you know, I think the city of Brooks has advanced amazingly in the last 10 years because we moved forward at every step. As fast as everybody wanted in every segment, probably not. Did we make errors? Absolutely we did, but we did them with the best of intentions and errors you can walk back and move forward. But if you blindly move on an ideological timeline or, or, or a course, you're going to leave carnage behind you. You're gonna leave people behind. And we just won't govern that way. So I hope people will consider that um, the Alberta party isn't about new politics. It's about politics the way it should always be. And I, and I hope they think about uh, supporting us in 2023. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you so much for the conversation. And I hope that we're maybe able to touch base again a little bit closer to the, the 2023. Um, hey, will you, guys be, will you guys be releasing, do you think, your platform before the early voting or after it? Yeah, before. No, definitely. We'll, uh, we're going to go through a process. I know that was there. I, I heard a few stories last time. No, there'll be a... There'll be a, a, a pretty good process, I think. Very lot of public engagement. And, you know, I think by the time the fall rolls around, you're going to see the, the guideposts for all our, for the main pieces of our platform, for sure. All right. Thank you again. Thank you, Nate. It was great. As Always, if you appreciate the kind of content that we're trying to produce here at The Breakdown, we would love it if you swung by our Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash thebreakdownab and signed up for a small monthly sponsorship of the work that we're trying to do here. It is because of the support that we receive from our Patreon sponsors that we're able to continually up our game and it is tremendously appreciated. So I wanna throw a big thank you out to them and you can go ahead and visit that website and join and support us as well because we need all the help we can get. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for listening and being a part of these important conversations. And we will see you next time on The Breakdown.